Hello, everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown. And today I want to discuss a very fascinating case, uh, which uh, the end of the case came uh, last month in January. Uh, Cindy Ali, uh, she had been in prison for quite a while for the first degree murder of her child, Sonata. And she managed to get an appeal through her lawyers and she has been acquitted as of last month. And so fascinating case. And I have discussed many cases before that have to do with uh, an innocence project. You know, somebody's in prison for the wrong reasons. Uh, they, they really weren't guilty. Uh, and here's all the evidence to prove they weren't guilty. Let's get them out. Uh, sometimes I have a lot of issues with innocence projects, things not that they were innocence project was involved in this, but the whole concept of that she was believed to be innocent by many. Um, a lot of people fought for her, her family fought for her. And the question is in this particular case, do I think she's innocent or do I not? Um, and what is the evidence in this case leaning one direction or the other? Now, before I get into all of this, I want to say, this is an educational channel. I'm not here to make a pronouncement. I'm not here to tell just a story. My educational channel is about profiling and crime scene analysis. And I'm going to take you through some of the different issues of the case and how I, as a profiler, would look at these things. All right. So I hope you're in for a little bit of a long ride because I want to explain things. That's what this channel does. Uh, well, this channel is me. So that's what I do. Um, I um, want to recommend that you also subscribe to the channel, like the video, because again, educational channel, I don't do gossip shows. So. I try to struggle along and continue giving you content that educates. Um, I also want to say I don't edit because <laughs> I'm lazy. So what you're going to see here is an unedited whatever. So bear with me if I uh, wander off someplace and have to come back. So, okay, let's get to the case. Now, <clears throat> this I have a lot of feelings about this case for a number of reasons. I've, I've worked with, um, I worked in the deaf community for over 13 years of my life. I worked with a lot of disabled people. Um, Sonara had cerebral palsy. And before everybody goes into an argument on how to pronounce that, um, <laughs> some people say cerebral palsy. Some people say cerebral palsy. A lot of people just say CP because they don't know which way to go. It's one of these things people fight about for no reason. All right. So she had cerebral palsy. I'll use that. Um, and she had severe cerebral palsy. There's there's different levels of cerebral palsy, and I think this is very important. Let me read you what level she had. Um, Sonara was born with severe cerebral palsy, was unable to walk, talk, or feed herself. That means she had a feeding tube. Um, she was also prone to seizures and aspiration pneumonia, which occurs when food is inhaled into the lungs. Okay, so... Oh very difficult situation. And I've linked below um, a, a father who is taking care of a child very similar to Sonara. And he shows what happens all day long taking care of a child who is in this condition. Very, very difficult. It, it is a massive amount of work. Um, and God bless every parent who loves their child enough to do that amount of work. And God bless families who pitch in and church communities to pitch in, anybody who pitches in to help. It's a very tough situation because there's not a thing called, quote, improvement in these kind of cases. Now, mind you, I want to say this. Cerebral palsy comes in different forms and different uh, levels of uh, disability. I've worked with people who have a cerebral palsy. Uh, when I was a me medical sign language interpreter, one of my interpreters did have cerebral palsy. Uh, he was in a wheelchair, but so what? He rolled onto the metro. He came to work. And he signed um, and he made good living. And so there's many people with cerebral palsy who who move on in life having they they, they have they get education. They, they have, maybe have mobility problems, but they work with them. They get married. They, you know, they have lives all the way into their 80s, you know. So there are those. That's that level. And then there's this level. This level is very difficult because you have a child who. May smile, and she did. She was a she was a smiler. And when I look at the, the the video link below, that that child was not a smiler. And God bless the father who managed to see happiness in his daughter and sadness in his daughter and pain. And I don't know if she he she actually felt those ways when he saw them, but he cared for her so so diligently uh, to give her a life 
though limited though it might have been, he still wanted to give her the best life he could. And I'm going to get into what I think about um, uh, how Cindy Ali took care of her daughter and how the family pitched in in the church and all that stuff. Um, but it's difficult. And I just want to know, let you know that, yes, Sonara had a very severe form of cerebral palsy. Okay. So now what happened? All right. Let me tell you the basics of what happened. All right. Uh, Sonara died at the Hospital for Sick Children on February 21st, 2011. Two days earlier, I'm going to point this out, was a Saturday. Uh, I looked that up. And this is this may have an importance in the case. So when I bring things up, I'm going to go back to them and, and explain why if I were working on this case, if I were working on it as a detective or as a profiler, or if, I'm, if I were part of a legal team, why this might be something to remember. Saturday morning, as far as I found through you know, YouTube. I mean, I'm sorry, <laughs> through Google, <laughs> not, not YouTube, Google. All right. Two days earlier, Cindy had called 911, claiming two men had broken into her Scarborough townhouse. This is, by the way, a Canadian case. Um, and uh, I have a wonderful amount of uh, Canadian patrons, which I appreciate. And if you want to join all my live shows, and this one is not a live show, click below, join my live shows. I have a lot of Canadian uh, subscribers and patrons. This is for you, too. Um, uh, this is uh, Scarborough. Uh, two men had broken into her Scarborough townhouse located on Burrow Hall's Boulevard. And they were searching for a package. I'll get to the package issue a little bit later. Um, she told dispatchers that her baby was no longer breathing. Her baby was no longer breathing. The, the term her baby is also extremely important. Uh, first responders found Cindy on the floor, seemingly uninjured. She was like lying at the bottom of, uh, under a sofa, like, like in front of a sofa, um, yet unresponsive. And Sonara was on the couch without vital signs. Okay, couch, sofa, however you want to call that. Um, and I will mention here that there was a, um, a firefighter who came in and saved her life. He, he did CPR and she was not dead. And so they took her to the hospital for sick children, but she then failed to survive. The, the firefighter was, uh, he kicked her a couple of times in the foot going, hey, hey, get up. I know you're faking it. The firefighter was kind of a weird character in my, my opinion, but I think he believed she killed her daughter. So he had this I, idea coming in when he saw this, that she was faking that anything was wrong with her. Why was she lying on the floor pretending something had happened to her? And so he was like, get up. And um, he claimed that he saw no footprints going into the house. So this, this plays into a lot of the arguments over whether there could have been two uh, criminals who came to her house and killed her daughter or whether that never, ever happened. So uh, that's all I'm going to say about the firefighter. He had his opinion, okay? Whether he's right or wrong, he had his opinion. All right, so she went to the hospital and, and, and did not survive. First responders, that's one of the guys, that guy, found Cindy on the floor, seemingly uninjured. Okay, so in March 2012, this is a year later, because, you know, the justice system seems to work like a snail. Um, Toronto police charged Cindy with manslaughter, a charge upgraded to first degree murder in the fall. Now, I have, a is I have an issue with their choice of upgrading this from manslaughter to um, first degree murder. It's not, I don't necessarily think that they're, they're completely wrong, but on the other hand, I sort of see why this is a problem. So I'll get to that too. All right. When the case went to trial five years later, well, about what, five years? Good Lord. Well, at least you got to spend five years of the family issues. <laughs> you know. But five years later, the prosecution argued Cindy had smothered Sonara and staged her home to look like a break-in. Uh, she did this, they alleged, because the burden of caring for Sonara had become too great. And I will talk about that. In her 2016 testimony, Cindy maintained her account of the break-in. She's always maintained her account of the break-in. She has never, ever said, changed her mind on it. She's always said there was a break-in. There were two guys, came to my house, forced their way in, looking for this package, and one of them killed my daughter. She's always maintained that. Um, she said that one of the intruders guided her through the home, searching for the package. 
The package is an interesting thing, just to point out here. Um, what is the package? Well, usually package, as far as I know, I watched The Wire, <laughs> one of the best uh, series ever made for TV. And the package is mentioned quite often on there because the package is drugs. And why else would somebody break in, come into somebody's home and say they're there for the package? Because um, that would be a drug package. Why they would go to a home that, well, you know, the boss sent them, they said, um, <laughs> why they would go to this particular address and have to force their way in and search for the package rather than the package being delivered to them. I don't know, but okay, the package. But do keep in mind the fact uh, the wire had been out for many years. Um, so sometimes people come up with ideas from shows that they watch. Not saying she did, but just pointing that out. All right. So they came in looking for the package and another stayed in the living room. So one of the intruders took her around the house there searching for the package. Um, I don't know if they ever told her how big the package was, how small the package was, what, you know, where they were looking, but they're supposedly going through the entire house, looking through drawers and I don't know, under, 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 <laughs> under the mattress, down to the basement. I don't know. They're looking for the package. And another stayed in the living room with Sonara. Well, pretty I'm going to say, how how many minutes does it take you to look at Sonara and figure out that she is not exactly going to be a great witness? <laughs> you know what I mean? She's not moving. She's 15, 15 years old, I believe. Uh, 15 years old. She's lying on a sofa. She clearly has cerebral palsy. She's not functioning. What, what does it matter that she's lying there? Uh, and so one of them has to stay with her, which is an odd thing right there. And so the other stayed in the living room with Sonara. When Cindy returned to the living room, she saw her daughter lying lifeless on the couch and that one of the men was holding a pillow. This is extraordinarily important. Cindy says there was a man standing there holding a pillow. Now, I'm going to say that when you're, when you're robbing a place, essentially, uh, trying to find drugs. Pillows aren't really your interest. Um, it's like, oh, what a nice pillow. I just want to look at it. It's a nice pillow. I want to hug it. <laughs> no, it's holding a pillow up. So what she is inferring is that that pillow was used to smother her daughter. And that is the crux of the case. The pillow. Keep this in mind. Because um, Cindy says, there was a person in her house holding a pillow and her daughter was dead. That infers that the person holding the pillow put the pillow over her daughter's face and killed her. That also infers that a pillow was used to kill her daughter, period. Because that, that's what happened. Like, okay, let's go on. The two men then said they'd gotten the wrong house. Now, I'm having a problem right here. The guys have looked through the house, can't find a package. How would they know they had the wrong house? Maybe they just didn't look in the right place. Why the why don't they she's Cindy never says they put the gun to her head and said, talk. Don't tell me where the package is. I'm gonna blow your brains out. These are drug dealers with a gun. <laughs> why isn't she saying where the frick the package is? Why didn't they blow her brains out? She's now a witness. Why did they kill her daughter but not kill her? kind of odd okay this this is why the police began to believe she was guilty okay so they said they got in the wrong house although they had no clue they got the wrong house and they proceeded to flee she told the court and they fleed supposedly not by going back out the front door they came in but and down through the basement and out saturday morning in february in canada just just pointing that out all right the jury deliberated for 10 hours before convicting Cindy of first degree murder and handing the mother of four, four children, uh, an automatic life sentence, no parole for 25 years. So this, this, the, the, the uh, jury did not buy the story that there were any invaders. Cindy was incarcerated for, for four years before defense lawyers, uh, James Lockyer and Jessica Zita launched a successful appeal of her conviction. And, you know, there was... Um, yeah, I mean, they fought to get her out, as we see many people to want, they're on the innocence side of things, saying a, a person has been wrongly convicted, and therefore we want to get them out. Um, 
And so there were these, there was definitely a, you know, sorry, that's the, that's the original thing. This is one of the stories that came out at the time that was trying to show you this. Here we have a ton of people trying to want Cindy out because they're like, this poor woman, she took care of this child all her life and did a wonderful job. And now they're, you know, she, she's a victim of a home invasion. And now, you know, she didn't do it. She didn't do it. So there was a, a great fight for that to get her out. Um, and so what happened then? All right. They argued. This is, this is the argument that the, the, the lawyers used to get the second trial. They argued that, that um, the first trial judge, no, wait a minute, let me go back here a second. They launched a successful appeal, arguing that the instructions given to the jurors were too narrow. Now, this is a thing that happens a lot in cases these days, and I'm not a lawyer, so forgive me for not being overly accurate on these kind of things. But I see this all the time. It's like the, the jurors go through this freaking long trial. They present a, cases from, you know, prosecution, defense, present the cases. And then the, jur the trial judge says something and then it like wipes out the entire trial. And so it happens here. So I don't know that that's correct, but you know, this is where you get the technicality thing where defense teams will say, Hey, this, this is this little technicality. Hey, we got, got a new, we got a, got a new trial. Because, you know, if you get enough new trials, uh, one of those trials will find somebody innocent. <laughs> um, but anyway, they forced it. The, they argued that um, the first trial judge instructed the jurors that if they believed Ali made up the robbery story, they should infer that she had participated in her daughter's death and should be found guilty of murder. Is that wrong? Either the robbery occurred or it didn't occur the attempted robbery. Either there were strangers breaking into her house who killed her daughter, or they didn't. It's, it's, it's like one or the other. Hey, it's, this is not rocket science. One or the other. So the judge said, basically, you don't believe her story. She done did it. Because if she says her daughter was suffocated with that pillow, and this is a very important point to this whole thing, she claims that a guy's standing there with a pillow, and so she is definitely inferring that that pillow was put over her daughter's face. Either that guy did it or he didn't do it. Which one is it? If he didn't do it, who done did it? Then it would be her. And the story is fake about the, the robbers coming into the house. That's what the judge was telling them. All right. Now, mind you, everybody who knows me knows I am not fond of the civilian jury system. I feel sorry for 12 people. I say 12 people off a bus stop, no training in, 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 in the crime scene analysis, no training in profiling, no training in anything. They're like ripped out of their lives, given crap money, if any, <laughs> chucked into a courtroom. They suffer through incredibly boring testimony for the most part. Uh, and then they're supposed to be, they're being played by both sides and they're supposed to come up with a conclusion because that's, that's, you know, fair, you know, a jury of your peers. I'm not fond of that. I want a professional jury. I've said this over and over again. I'd like five people on a professional jury picked out of, you know, just, just the, their names come up. They, they go on the jury. There are five people, five. I don't believe in the one judge system, which is the second uh, uh, trial here is just one judge. I don't believe in that crap either. I want five, at least five people. So I want five trained, trained jurors who are trained in criminal profiling and crime scene analysis and all the kinds of things you need to understand who is trying to bamboozle you, the prosecution or the defense. You understand which expert is full of crap and is lying because he just got paid $40,000 to lie. I want that. Okay. Off that soapbox. Let's go back to this. So, uh, <laughs> and it says they should infer if, if the story is made up that she was participated in her daughter's death, she'll be found guilty of murder. Her, her lawyers argued they this forced the jury into an all or nothing decision. Exactly. Because it is all or nothing. She either did it or she didn't do it. There are either robbers there or there are not robbers there. It really is all or nothing. And failed to consider alternative scenarios. What are those alternative scenarios? Well, let me find a page that tells me what the alternative scenarios were. Hmm. All right. Okay, hold on a second. I got to find it here because I found it just fascinating. All right. The jury instructions, according to them, were wrongly narrowed the proper scope of their deliberations. 
uh, it is essential that the all defenses and verdicts reasonably are available on the evidence leave the jury for are left with the jury for consideration. Well, that's what the prosecution is defenses for, not for the judge. Okay, I mean basically, if they presented the cases, they they did present the case. Now, what did they say? All right, uh, the appeal court, which is why she got the appeal, found that the jurors should have been given other theories to consider. No, no, what, what? Either she did it or she didn't. What are the other theories? Aside from murder, such as the possibility that Ali panicked when her daughter was having a seizure and she didn't do enough to save her. So basically they're saying she, you should consider that she killed, she did go ahead and kill her and made up the whole story, but she did it for another reason. She panicked over something else. Well, I'm going to say bull on that, first of all, because she had been taking care of her daughter for years. If her daughter had had a seizure that didn't go well, she would have called 911. I mean, nobody would have accused her of anything. Her, this child could die at any point in time because of all her serious issues. And she knew that. And I'm, they, uh, the family had worked hard for years, making sure she was safe and all these things. And so she would just call 911. Is that what you have in Canada? <laughs> I think it's 911 in Canada too. Um, so she would do that. Uh, so if her daughter had any natural disaster, uh, you know, she start, had uh, an inhalation, she inhaled something she shouldn't have inhaled, she had a seizure that was bad, whatever, she just called 911. Nobody would have blamed her for one darn thing. But she says a man stood over her daughter with a pillow, indicating that her child was indeed suffocated. So either that man did it with a pillow or she did it with a pillow. I don't know where we else we have to go with that. That's just simply the facts. All right. But she got the re she got the the uh, the new trial based on this ridiculous concept that she should have been the, the jury should have said okay maybe she did do it there wasn't a robbery and she's just lying about it but she had a good reason for doing it she freaked that's a, <laughs> that I don't think that's the jury's should have to figure that out I think that that may come down to what she should be charged with was it first degree murder could have been manslaughter which it was originally what is the case. Well, the case in the, in the prosecution's opinion was that it was premeditated. And if indeed she put a pillow over her daughter's face, it does come under that. that yeah, that's pretty much the right label. Why she put the, the pillow over her daughter's face is another issue. And I don't know, the defense could have fought that one. But she said there were robbers and she didn't do anything wrong. Okay, so she got the new trial. And this is, this is what she was then... She was then acquitted. Look at what she, how, how it came. On January 19th of uh, 2023, just last month, uh, nearly 13 years after Sonera died, Superior Court Justice Jane Kelly acquitted Ali of the first degree murder charge. Kelly also found her not guilty of the included offenses of second degree murder and manslaughter. While the judge noted she was left in a state of uncertainty about the events, <laughs> so the judge doesn't really don't know what happened. Um, uh, that took place on the morning of February 19th, 2011, she found the Crown had failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Cindy had committed the offenses. So the problem came down to this, that what she's saying is the Crown couldn't prove that she did it because suffocation, by the way, is a very hard thing to prove. I mean, as you pick up a pill and put it on somebody's face, the, what's going to be circumstantial evidence around that pillow, right? So the point comes down to whether there were two guys in the house or not. The two guys in the house prove whether she did or did not do it. And they're saying that they didn't prove properly, the prosecution, that two guys were in her house. Like they didn't have physical proof two guys were in her house. Well, that's true. They didn't prove two guys were ever there, which would mean maybe there's no two guys ever been there. But that's, you can't prove a negative. So they're saying if you couldn't, prove that they weren't there, which they kind of did prove, but then therefore you can't say she's guilty. So see how this is a very convoluted thing. Now, I want to go back to what proof there is. And first I want to talk about uh, Cindy Ali, because I do think she was a good mother. Okay. I want to say that right now. I do think she was a good mother. Nothing that I've found says she wasn't a caring and loving mother not a thing. I want to say that um, there she is after she finally got exonerated. Uh, this is her husband, Al Alan Ali. Now he has been, he has stood by her through this entire thing and says she is innocent. 
Her entire family believes she is innocent. She's also involved in this particular church. This is the church, uh, Church of the Rock. Um, very, very involved in this church. And they stand by her as well. And the whole church community, pretty much. So nobody thought of her as a bad person. Now, let me, let me just show you a couple pictures. Um, because I think this truly does tell us a little bit about her. Look at this. Look at her. Look at the, see, this does not look like an unhappy child. I mean, I'm, well, I'll point this out. I don't know what the smile means sometimes when a person has severe disabilities, but she's been cared for by many, many people. Um, here's some, I'm going to share more pictures of her being cared for, but look at this. She, they took her out to see a horsey. Um, now, so they took her on vacations. They took, they were, the whole family was amazing. And I will say this, having worked in a um, disabled community for 13 years of my life, I'm going to say impressive. It's a lot of work and that they're willing to do all this and, and, and care for her this way. It was important to me. Now, another thing, um, I'm going to bring up some cultural issues. Um, this family, um, probably for, uh, they were immigrated, they had immigrated from Trinidad. Um, and so in the immigration from Trinidad, they brought along some of their Trinidadian culture. All right. Everybody has a culture. And um, one of the things I have noted, and you know, if you're Jamaican or Trinidadian, feel free to leave some comments uh, below, just nice ones and not nasty ones. <laughs> um, I was married to a Jamaican for 25 years and uh, been divorced for 20 years. So Still married for, to a Jamaican for 25 years, spent time in Jamaica, never been to Trinidad, but also we had Trinidadian friends. So I have been around culturally, around that culture. Um, but Jamaica, Trinidad, not two, not two of the same places, both in the Caribbean, but, you know, two different countries. And they still have a little bit of a, a little a thing between them, like Jamaica's better, Trinidad's better. And if you're Jamaican or Trinidadian, you will, in the comments, should say you're right about that. All right. So. But one of the things I have noted in, culturally is there is a, a great kindness in both cultures of Jamaica and Trinidad for caring for people who are elderly, caring for family, caring for disabled. I, I have, I've been a really quite, it's quite amazing to me uh, how the, there's a kind of a warmth toward people who have, have physical dis difficulties and I will tell you when my mother had Alzheimer's and she went to a memory center and, and when she first arrived, um, two ladies came to the, the front and I didn't know who these two ladies were. And they started speaking. And I said, Oh my God, you're Jamaican. And they're like, yeah, you know, I'm like, I was so happy because I knew from the warmth from them that this was going to be a good place for my mother to stay. Um, and it also turned out they were actually from my ex-husband's hometown, Clarendon, go figure. But anyway, so, I believe, truly believe, from what I know culturally and from all the photos I've seen, that this child was loved by her family and loved by her mother. I do not doubt that. So one of the problems we have sometimes when we have too much emotions coming in and out is that we, we want to say, oh, um, well, I either feel no total love or I feel total hate, you know, no, I, I'm, I'm going by evidence. And what I, the evidence I see here, and from my knowledge of culture, I see a loving family. I believe that this child was well taken care of until that day she died. Now, then what happened <laughs> on that day? And this is where things get a little sticky. Now, um, the story. Let's go to the story about the two guys coming to the home. The story is this. Um, and this is where the, the prosecution, the police, began to suspect that Cindy may have killed her daughter. Um, now, why would Cindy have killed her daughter if she was such a loving parent? Why would she do this? Well, let me tell you something. <sighs> Taking care of a child in this condition is incredibly exhausting. And over the years, I mean, I can't even imagine. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I would have been so good a person. <laughs> I mean, I hope I would care for my children that way if they had those kind of issues, but I, I'm not, I'm, I don't, I don't know. I haven't been there. Haven't done that. So if you have to get up every morning and all through the day and night, you've got to change diapers and feed and prop prop and all the things you've got to do to keep that child alive. And also 
you want to give them something, some kind of quality of life. And that's extraordinarily difficult. And it's, it, and it, it is incredibly costly as well. So, you know, you're running out of, you know, she's, they say they had enough money and enough insurance, but it wasn't like, I don't think 100%. So, you know, you're raising all these kids, you've raised your other, your other kids too. And you have this child, it just, it's exhausting and it's demoralizing at times and, and financially a, a disaster. And, um, you don't, let's say you just, you don't want to dump your child in an institution. That was something that happened years ago. And you know, your child may not be treated well. So you don't want to do that to your child because you love that child. So the defense has said, perhaps it was a mercy killing. The defense has gone there. All right. Let's just, is there a reason that she might've committed a mercy killing? Well, here's another thing. As people who have severe, well, let's say uh, cerebral palsy in general, as people age, cerebral palsy, it's got so many issues wrapped up with it. Then there can be worse mobility issues, worth all kinds of different issues that affect all of your body, including seizures and increasing pain. Now, if you are able to take care of yourself to some extent and you have your mental facilities with you, um, is that faculties or facilities? <laughs> you know, I hate it when I do these shows and I'm like, do I know the English language? Mm. Your mental stuff. <laughs> we'll go there. I don't want to edit, but I hate it. Okay. So anyway, <laughs> um, if you have everything together, but you're experiencing all of this, you, you know, you're going to have to deal with it and you have to find ways to deal with it. And it can be very difficult. It can, you know, every day can be a challenge, but this child cannot deal with it because she has no ability to deal with it. It's the parent who has to deal with it. Now, this parent over here starts seeing this child perhaps having more seizures, perhaps having more pain, and seeing that the future of this child is miserable, that her life is going to be maybe hell too. The whole family is just you know, where, you know, maybe she just would love to be able to travel with her husband, to be to hang out with her other children and the new grandchildren, and not to spend 24 hours a day in care. But, you know, that would be a selfish thing, but you can understand it. But what if she also saw her daughter was just getting worse and worse and worse and struggling? And that morning, her daughter has seizures and she says, oh, my God, no more. Just no more. I can't take it. And she grabs a pillow and does this. And then her daughter is at peace and it's over. But now she realizes she is guilty of homicide. So she does she stage this this uh, this robbery. Now let's take a look at, could she have staged that? Would she have staged that? Is there anything that makes a robbery more believable or less believable? Let's look at it. Um, so there was no evidence of anybody in that house, unfortunately for her, there was none, no sign of a break-in because she said they rang the bell. She opened the door and they pushed away. Um, there was just nothing to prove anybody had been in the house. There were some opened up drawers and things like that, but that's something anybody can stage in a second. Just run around real quick and then call 911 and lie on the floor. So it didn't seem believable to, to the, the uh, police. Now, here's, here's how she states how this all happens. Two guys, not Saturday morning, broad daylight, but they're dressed in, she claims, um, suits, black suits and black masks. And, and the suit thing really struck me. And I'm like, oh, wait, wait. and she says they had thick Jamaican accents. Okay. There's a lot of Jamaicans in the area. So that's not unreasonable. Uh, she's Trinidadian, but she's saying it's Jamaicans. All right. Um, suits. Do Jamaican thugs, drug dealers run around in suits? I, I don't understand that. So I'm looking around the area thinking, where would that come from? There was a witness that supposedly was making a bank transaction and saw two guys in suits somewhere around that time in the area. And so the defense team's like, oh, you know, the prosecution should have followed this. I mean, the, the police should have followed this up 100%. And maybe they didn't do a good enough job. I, I'm not going to get in here on how bad the police did their job or blah, blah, blah. I, I, you know, that's a whole nother thing. I'm looking at, I'm, I'm analyzing the case itself. Two guys in the area on a Saturday morning in suits. My first thought is Jehovah's Witnesses. There's, there are three Jehovah's Witness uh, kingdom halls in the, in Scarborough. Uh, one is fairly close to the home, 
And um, depending on when when the, uh, the the hall has their meetings, you know, that could be Saturday, it could be Sunday, it could, you know, whatever. Uh, depending on um, sometimes the, the 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 Kingdom Hall has meetings in different languages. So you have you know your English one, and then you have your sign language one. Then you might have your Spanish one, and maybe you'll have you know whatever other language uh, you think is necessary in that area. Um, so if they don't have um, a, a meeting at that particular point in time, some, some of the witnesses will go, will go out and service. Uh, sometimes they go as a group. They never go alone. So they either go two or more, and they go out either as a group or at least a couple guys go out together. And what are they going to wear? Suits, because they like to be well-dressed. Uh, and so that when they knock on somebody's door, they don't look like thugs. So, you know, they always dress well. Women usually in skirts and dresses and the men in suits. Um, yet you have that for some other religions like Mormon religion. And, uh, you know, so, and, you know, it, it, so two guys in the neighborhood on a Saturday morning walking around in some suits. Could it have been Jehovah's Witnesses? I don't know. It wasn't ever investigated terribly well as far as I know. But, okay, how do things work in people's minds, though? Let's say that she, at that point in time, had looked out her window um, and she was having, to, you know, taking care of her daughter. And she looked out the window and she saw two guys go by in suits. What a lot of people will do is grab onto what they see, right? Because they have. It's hard to make stuff up. So then, when they say what happened, she goes, "Oh, it was two guys in suits," because she'd seen two guys in suits. And so she then she, you know, says, "Oh, and they were wearing masks," because she's got to say that. So they put they had some masks on. Um. And it is winter, so theoretically they could have ski mask on. It's February in Toronto, so, you know, it could be cold. Um, so, and somebody else saw some guys in black suits. Do they see them in masks and black suits? I, I didn't hear that. So, but that's how things kind of work. So, could they have just been Jehovah's Witnesses in the community? Yes. Would two Jamaican drug-dealing thugs show up in a suit on her doorstep? It's not very likely, especially on a Saturday morning. <laughs> okay, so they cl she claims they buzzed. She opened the door and go, ah, they tried, shoved away. The next thing we hear is some very strange stuff. So one is going to stay with the child that doesn't matter as far as witness goes or anything else, because obviously this child is disabled, severely disabled. And the other one takes her running around the house looking for this package. And again, maybe she watched the wire and that's where the package, where it came from. But she also says something, a couple of really strange things. She claims she went to the kitchen, threw knives at threw knives at them. I'm going to say, <laughs> if somebody has got a gun pointed at me, throwing knives does not really work well. I'm like, what? There were some knives on the floor. So it's like, is this another attempt to look like there's something that happened there? And then supposedly she got down to the basement and then she like, like pushed them or something and ran upstairs. The guy had a gun. If you're with a guy with a gun in the basement, you're not pushing anybody because you're going to get shot in the head. And the theory is she's going to run upstairs to save her daughter. But again, most of the time, people coming in on a, a home invasion, they're going to kill you, not your disabled daughter who can't can't even speak. They're going to kill you, but they don't kill you. After they decide they have the wrong house for reasons completely unknown, <laughs> they decide to go out the basement, which I don't even know how they knew that there was a basement door that went anywhere if they were strangers. So that's her story. Now, when she came back upstairs, you know, the guy was holding the pillow up in the air and the kid was dead. Now, no place does she ever say, don't hurt my daughter. Don't hurt my daughter. Don't. She says, my baby, my baby. But she doesn't say, don't hurt my daughter. Or you've done, what have you done to my daughter? We don't hear that. The story is not a good story. That is why the police were suspicious. But then things get weirder. After this happens, a letter arrives at the home. And I just find this absolutely fascinating, this whole letter business. So a letter arrives at the home. What does the letter say? And, and it's funny because when I started, this is the letter on, on the le on right here. All right. This is a whole letter. And, and it was just kind of funny because, you know, when, people, when, when a letter is written, this is written to the family, the Ali family, to explain that they there were two guys that came to get this package and that they had the wrong house and, 
and and it's a very strange letter. First of all, it's strange because what two th drug dealing thugs are going to waste their time apologizing for entering that home? That makes zero sense to begin with. Secondly, not once do they mention killing the child, which is also interesting. Sorry, we kid you, killed your kid. They say, hey, we didn't kill you. But they didn't say, we didn't kill your kid, which is weird. But when I started reading this right up front, and I had not even gotten into the whole story. I didn't even know who these people were at the point when I read this letter. Um, I did not know that, that, um, that the Elites were Trinidadian. I had no idea. I just thought they, they were just, they were black, but eh, so, so what, you know, um, I, I didn't know what culture they came from, um, whether they were born in Canada, um, had no particular, uh, they weren't immigrants, um, where they immigrated from tr uh, Trinidad. I really didn't know. So I'm, I'm starting to read this letter and I'm like, boy, does this sound Jamaican? <laughs> and remember, she said there were two Jamaican guys with thick accents. That's what she said. See? Oh, well, she says over. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. Over. Wait a minute. Oh, I got to move out of the way here. Uh, heavy accents like Jamaicans. And then she said the reason she would know is because we have some we have we have Jamaican families. In other words, we're Trinidadian, but we have maybe some Jamaican in, uh, marriage. I don't know. She didn't get into that. But I'm reading this and right up front, I'm like, it's Jamaican. Now, why do I say that? Well, again, I was married to a Jamaican for 25 years and we used to get a lot of letters from Jamaica and you just read them and they're written like Jamaicans would write a letter. Um, um, I can also recognize deaf people's writing. So I, read, I can read some and go, yeah, that person's deaf because they write in deaf grammar. <laughs> if the, Now, mind you, there are deaf people who write better way better English, American English than I do, or British English, whatever they're from, Indian English, <laughs> whatever the deaf person's from, they write perfect English of their English of their country. Perfect. Again, way better than me who can't seem to figure out faculties and facilities. But anyway, um, they're, they're excellent writers, highly educated, write beautifully. They have two languages. They have English and they have their sign language. In America, it would be English and American Sign Language. In, 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 in uh, England, it would be English and uh, um, uh, a British Sign Language. In India, English and many other countries. Hindi is another major um, national language. And they have Indian Sign Language. And some people can do both. They're bilingual. But some people, uh, like when I was working with people, they didn't have as much education. So they wrote, they tried to use English words to stick them to signs. And they were in, the grammar was very much American sign language as opposed to being English grammar. So I could recognize it just like that. So I'm reading this. I'm like, that's so Jamaican-ish. <laughs> now, I'm not exactly correct. I'm going to explain why I'm not exactly correct. All right. So, um, What's really is absolutely the, the letter was too. The letter made no sense to me to begin with, but I'm going to point out some issues about this this uh, letter. Let me read from some of the letter. Um, hold on a sec. Let me pull it up. Let me see if I can find it. First of all, okay. Where did I put it? Where did I put it? Well, by the way, while I'm while I'm talking, if you want to see a good a movie uh, documentary about this, do check out. Um, the, the, oops, sorry, that's a, that's a picture from the Madeline McCann case. <laughs> Sonara. Check out Sonara. It's on, uh, um, I'll have the link below. Um, it is a Canadian um, documentary, um, and I used a, a VPN to be able to access it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to access it. But if you're in Canada, you can definitely access it. If, you, if you're out of Canada, you have to use a VPN and say you're in Toronto. Um, uh, so the link will be below. The first 20 minutes are so bad that you're like, I don't even want to watch this crap. I was so bored. I was like, what the hell are you even talking about? And then uh, thank God I stayed in it because it got better and it got very interesting. But you want to check that out. Okay, let me go to the the uh, words on this um, letter. All right. Let me find it. Let me find it. Okay, the letter. So they get the letter. And by the way, this guy's name is Clive Forrester. And he, he's very important here. He's a forensic linguist uh, at the University of Waterloo. All right. So they send this letter out. And so when I'm, when I'm, when I'm reading the letter, 
again, I said immediately, all I, I, I was like, this is, this is so, if this is so Jamaican-ish to me. And I say Jamaican-ish for a reason. Hold on, I'm still trying to find the crap. Where'd it go? I had it all set up here and now I can't find it. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Patience, patience, my dear friends. Um, <laughs> everybody knows I always lose my pictures. It is so annoying. Okay, maybe it's over here. Okay, please be here. Okay, here we go. <laughs> all right, the letter. <laughs> all right. I'm going to read this in a Jamaican accent, and um, it's going to be a, a crappy Jamaican accent. And there are some people out there who are going to get really snotty and say, just because you're married to a Jamaican doesn't mean you can speak Jamaican or you know anything about Jamaica. This is true. But then again, I live in Maryland and I don't have the crap about Maryland either. And I can't speak in some of the Maryland accents if I try to imitate them. So just put up with me. I just, the reason I'm going to do this in a fa faux bad Jamaican accent is to show you why it struck me as being Jamaican as opposed to something else. Because when the question is, did, the, did these supposed robbers write this and drop it off at their house in order to help her out to say, hey, police, we did it. She didn't, she's innocent, which is a bizarre thing that anybody would do anyway. But if, if it wasn't them, how would somebody write that letter? Because, you know, when you're writing a letter that is in a, a language, which would be Jamaican Creole, um, it is not your language. It's very hard to write in somebody else's language. Very, very difficult. So especially if you have no connection. In the beginning, I didn't even know she was from the Caribbean. So I'm reading this and it says here, when the boss say go get the package at 118, the boss, and that isn't and that is kind of a Jamaican thing. Some woman opened up, but she tried to close back the door. Right there, close back the door. I'm like, Jamaican. <laughs> that was the first thought in my head. Why? Because you don't say close back the door, as far as I know in American English or Canadian English, close back the door. I don't know, I could be wrong. You can you can correct me if you're nice. Otherwise, I just block you. Um Close back the door. I know after being married to a Jamaican for a really long time, I would tell people to plug out the light. And people would look at me and go, huh? I go, just plug out the light. And they would go, you mean unplug the light? And I'm like, I hadn't said unplug in years because I always heard plug out. <laughs> so, so close back the door to me was Jamaican-ish. And I'm going to say ish because it's gonna be, this is going to be a point in a minute. But we push we way in. Oh, come on now. That is so like Jamaica. We push we way in. Not we push our way in. We push we way in. Because she all because all she keeps say, not saying, all she keeps say is my baby, my baby. Now, yeah. My baby, my baby. She lucky we did not kill she. All right. So I'm looking at this going Jamaican-ish. But of course, I don't know all the Patois, uh, the Creoles in the other countries in the Caribbean. This dude, so I'm thinking, okay, she says she got, at first I didn't know she had any Jamaican connections at all. So I'm thinking maybe she had no way to write this. She wouldn't know how to write this. But then she says she has Jamaican family. I'm like, all right, now we're getting closer. Maybe she could have written it. But could she have written it, even if you have Jamaican family, I really personally could not write. I mean, if I'm hanging around, when I used to be married, I used to go into little things. I, there were definitely things I said that were more Jamaican-ish. I don't say fritter, I say flitters. Okay, so there are more Jamaican-ish things I say. And if I'm hanging with Jamaicans, I, I can, not on purpose necessarily, just I switch into more of a Jamaican accent, more Jamaican words. If I'm yelling at my children, I know how to yell and slow. You know, <laughs> if anybody's Jamaican, you know what I'm talking about. As an American, I would go, you know, your kids are really annoying me. But and if I go into Jamaican stuff, I go, you know, children, you're really making me mad. <laughs> I go real slow. And then the kids know you're really upset. I also know how to tell a story with us, you know, yourself three times over. It's a three thing, you know, in the U.S. we don't do that. We so we say, oh, so I went to the store, period. But a Jamaican will say, you know, you went for the store. And then, I think I'm not just what you say. It's been, it's been 20 years. I went for the store. 
to the store. I know. And and when we go to the store, you know what happened when we went to the store? <laughs> There's always like a three for my, my, my mother in law was fabulous at telling stories. It just made me laugh so hard. She was so good at it. You know, she said that the man came over and he cut the grass. And what him do to the grass? Him shave it down. And then him him just make it, he make the grass small. So it's like three times. You got to do the same thing, but with a different thing. So sorry for the accent. That's really bad. I apologize, but get over it. All right. So anyway, I'm like, there's a lot of Jamaican stuff here, but does she, can she write Jamaican? And I can't write Jamaican. As you can see, I probably have a hard enough time faking Jamaican. Uh, she, can she write Jamaican? And if she, I'm thinking if she's not Jamaican, Jamaican, she can't do it. But she has Jamaican family. Is that enough? But then an interesting thing came up. So Clive Forrester says this about this sentence. She lucky we did not kill she. And he says, using she in both the subject and the object position, common in Trinidadian, absent in Jamaican Creole. Now, I tried to look all this stuff up because I did not know if that was true, and I could not figure it out. He says it's not Jamaican. It goes further. Um, then he says, um, go further, further in the letter. Hold on a second. Um, and then it says, uh, they, they and the police are not going to catch we because we shoes have a cover over it. That's that. He's not talking about the Jamaican accent there. He's just talking about uh, we shoes have a cover over it. What do you think that means? She's, it's, um, this person is trying to explain why they could not identify who these people were. Um, so you tell me two, two Jamaican thugs showing up are going to put coverings on their shoes. I don't even buy that. But that does explain why the police didn't get any evidence, you see. And then he goes on to say, it feels, it feel good. This is in the, this is in the letter. It feel good to get she a couple of kick. In other words, somebody kicked her two times, a couple of kicks. Well, that actually was a firefighter who kicked her in the feet a couple of times, just to like rouse her. But that has nothing to do with these guys. She never said these guys ever kicked her, but it does. It's like part of the kicking thing that she experienced. Then he said, we does be, okay, we does be. Because uh, we does, we does be that I can't find that spot there, but we does be, he said. Uh, it eliminates this this phrase, we does be, in the sentence that it's in. It eliminates Jamaican Creole. And so this other guy says, hey, you mean it, they're trying to make it sound like it's Jamaican? And he says, yeah, they, it has some Jamaican features, but if you wanted to sound Jamaican, there are a few simple things you could do to include that would change, that would cause the Jamaican to come up in the pool and to rise to the top. And they're absent. So while it worked for me, I, I was willing to believe it was Jamaican because I, I'm not skilled enough. He was saying, if it was really, really Jamaican, there would be these other things. First of all, some things shouldn't be there and some things should have been there. And he said, no. He said, that's their absent. So he says, it's Trinidadian or somebody trying to be Jamaican who's really Trinidadian. And that's very interesting to me. The letter makes no sense. No bunch of criminals, no bunch of drug dealing Jamaicans are going to waste their time sending a letter to exonerate her. That makes zero sense because everything in the letter is about proving that two guys showed up at the door, that they pushed the button, that this lady tried to stop them from coming in, that they covered their shoes and they didn't kill her. And so explaining the crime scene. No Jamaican is going to waste their time with that crap. I mean, a Jamaican thug, not a not a good Jamaican, but a Jamaican thug. No, he's not going to be doing that crap. You know, he's going to say, too bad. <laughs> anyway, so I believe that letter was not written by the, the robbers. Now, what's interesting about the defense team, you know what they say? Well, we're not saying she wrote it. We think somebody else might have written it to help her. So even the defense team doesn't believe that the robbers wrote. They believe somebody, her or somebody close to her at least, wrote that to try to help her because they felt bad for her. So what we have all put together, we have a ridiculous robbery scene that there's zero proof of those robbers ever being in the house. It makes no sense that one of the robbers would find a need to kill a completely disabled child who clearly is disabled 
Now he's upstairs with that girl for a long time. And the other guy's rolling through the entire house. He, no, she's lying there in bed. I, I don't want to do a, a, an acting job of a person with a cerebral palsy. I'll get nailed for that. But she does not look, quote, normal to a Jamaican robber. He's going to look at her and go, dang, what's up with that? No, nah, she's something wrong with that girl. That's what they're going to say. Something's wrong with her. And and she's not responding properly. She doesn't talk. She's looking gay. Her gaze is off. You know, he's not going to be, he's got a mask on. Why is he going to kill the girl? He's got a freaking mask on. <laughs> Why is he going to kill her? Because it was amusing. It makes zero sense. So they would kill her. They would not kill the child. So the whole story is garbage. I'm sorry. I can't buy the story. It's like the worst story ever. I believe 100%. She made the story up. If I believe 100% she made the story up and she talked about the pillow and the pillow was the way that killed the child, I believe that somebody killed the child with a pillow and if she made the story up, the child, person who killed the child with a pillow would be her. So why? Why would she do this and why would she stick to this robbery story forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? Okay, why? Why would she do that? I'm going to say this. I think she was a good mother. Absolutely. I think she was a good mother. I think she cared for her children. I think her family cared for her. I think that she might have come to that point. And I don't call it snap. You don't snap, but you come to the point where you can't go on anymore. And you feel like you can't give enough anymore. And this child is, can't withstand anymore. And in that moment, I do believe it was a mercy killing. That was most likely. I can't now mind you. I'm not saying it was. I'm not saying she's guilty. She's, she's been acquitted. I'm not saying she killed her child. I'm saying I understand why that might have been a choice a mother would make and then why she would lie about it. Because the family has great respect for her. And I don't think she would ever, if she committed this crime, even though she's been acquitted, if she committed the crime, she would never want her family to know that she did that. She would want the family to believe she died some other way and that they would not blame her for her death and that they could go on and be a happy family and remember Sonara and love her in memory and everybody would be okay. I don't think she could ever admit that she did such a thing if she did such a thing. So She's been acquitted. Um, do I feel bad that she's been acquitted? Not really. Um, I honestly do understand in this case, if she did commit this crime. Now, there's some people out there in the disabled community who go, well, just because you're disabled doesn't mean you should be murdered. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. All I can say is that we haven't walked in her shoes. And if I walked in her shoes for 15 years, and did everything I could. And I saw maybe my daughter getting worse and worse and worse. And I couldn't stand the pain she was going through. And I couldn't deal with the pain I was going through. And what the family was going through, I would say maybe in that moment, no, it, maybe she had a seizure at that moment. And the mother just said enough and pushed the pillow. Not saying she did that. I'm just saying, I understand that. I actually, there's very rare times. I don't, I don't go much for these kind of excuses most of the time. But in this particular case, I can, I can see it. Um, I can understand it. Was it, would it be premeditated? Well, premeditated is a little different. It would be like, I looked at her that morning and said, I'm going to kill you. And then I, I, I look around, I plan and I get the pillow and do it. I personally don't think it would have gone down that way. If it did go down, I think it would be more that when she was seizing and having issues that the mother was so right there with the pillow happened to be right there. And she said, enough. Now, theoretically, if you have a moment to think before you commit the crime, it's premeditated. Uh, some people will call it snapping. Some people would call it uh, temporary insanity. But the time between them is losing it and doing it is fairly short. And in this case, I would say, I wouldn't know. I don't know that I would have gone for the, the first degree murder charge. If I believe she did it, I don't think I would go for the first degree murder charge. I would have gone for some lesser charge. Uh, not that it was right. And that she maybe should have to pay the price for taking somebody's life. 
Um, but it's one of these instances where I sort of get what the problem was and why someone might cross that line. I understand it. This doesn't mean I approve of it, but I sort of do understand it. She spent a lot of time in prison. She was under the gun for five years. She spent a lot of time in prison. Um, and now she's back with her family. I'm not, I'm not like, like some, when I see some people get, they get exonerated. I'm like, are you kidding me? That person's guilty as hell. And they're a psychopath. I don't, I don't see her as a psychopath. And you know, I love to use the word psychopath. So I don't see her as a psychopath. So I really, un, I really think that I can understand the situation if she committed the crime. And I'm not, as I've been, not been out of shape that she is, was acquitted. I think all the nonsense about the, the defense was nonsense. I think the judge was nonsense. I think a lot of these people are trying to get her off with nonsense. I mean, I, I, I that personally, I'm like, a, you know, I, I think, I, you know, you have to do things properly and you have to do things that make sense. But, you know, using excuses to try to get people out uh, it bothers me because we do have a justice system. We should follow the rules and we should follow logic in the justice system. And, you know, just because I want somebody to get out because I think they paid, they paid enough of the price. I think the judge believes she committed the crime. I believe the judge does believe that, but she found a way to get her out. So she's like, okay, whatever. <laughs> I, I don't think they proved the case enough. Boom, accorded. Um, I don't approve of the methodology. I'm not all that bent in shape about the result, um, but I don't like the methodology. Uh, so I think this whole case might have been handled in a better way throughout the entire case without throughout the prosecution. But it's, so it's, it's a, it's, it's a difficult case that, um, uh, but there are many cases where mothers kill their children, where people feel sorry for them. And I'm like, stop feeling sorry for them. The psychopaths who wanted the children out of their lives, so just like this male psychopath who just do family annihilations and wipe everybody out. We don't feel sorry for them, but somehow when women, oh, they got postpartum depression. They got this issue. They were, they, their husbands were mean, you know, they, you know, and so that we let the women off the hook when they're psychopaths killing their children in cold blood, in cold blood, knowing exactly what they're doing, planning it all and killing them one after another, looking them in the damn eyes. Those are psychopathic females. And I don't like to see them walk out of prison. In this case, I don't, don't actually think she's psychopathic. And I kind of, kind of get it if she committed the crime, if she did it. So those are my thoughts on this. This is a, how I look at it as a profiler. I hope, I hope that my explanations help you understand things more. Um, and again, do feel free to write things in the comments, be polite, please. <laughs> I suffer so much nasty comments. Please just be nice. Okay. Uh, and um, and uh, again, if you're new to the channel, please do like, and subscribe because again, it's an educational channel. I don't do tons of shows of gossip and crap like that. And it, it's a lot to keep this channel even going. Um, so I always appreciate the support. Uh, so check out my description below and the links. And um, I hope you enjoyed this take. And um, that's it for now. Bye.